of Elijah. And I'd like us to begin today by opening up to Genesis chapter 12. Because as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are, we become associated with God's people, God's land, and God's promises. And so then, at the beginning of today, look at those opening verses there in Genesis chapter 12, and you can see, can't you, that God promised Abraham a land, a great nation, a name, and then nestled there at the end of verse 3, the very reason why we are here today is that all families of the earth would be blessed. That that's something to, to appreciate at the beginning of today, that the reason why you and I are here is because of the faith of Abraham. And because of Abraham, then we become associated with Abraham and the promises, as the Apostle Paul says, that when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you become an heir of Abraham. You become a member of of his seed. Think about these words of Jerusalem here. The prophet Jeremiah says, let Jerusalem come into your mind. Now, a number of snaps I share today are snaps from the family. Uh, this is uh, the hands of one of my daughters. I won't disclose, I won't embarrass. But there you are. The last time as a family we went to Jerusalem. Let Jerusalem be in your mind. So as we begin today, brothers and sisters and young people, is Jerusalem in your mind? With all the things that are taking place in the Middle East, is this something that we are thinking about as young people? Think about the climax of the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul finally finds himself in Rome. He's about to stand in front of Caesar, and he declares to the leaders in Rome, for the hope of Israel... I am bound with this chain. So you can see then right away that the hope of Israel, that the promises to Abraham, being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, we become associated with these promises. And, and they go from Abraham, they run all the way through Jeremiah, and now the Apostle Paul, who's going to be the servant to the Gentiles, he now embraces this message. It's important, isn't it, when we think about what's taking place in Israel we, as God's people, need to be thinking about the land and the city and the promises. Now, as we know, in Scripture, there was this expectation, because it had been prophesied, prophesied that the children of Israel would reject the Son of God. Then Rome took Jerusalem, the temple uh, was, was brought to the ground, and we have the Diaspora. The diaspora. It's a, a bit of an unusual word, isn't it? But diaspora simply means the, the dispersion of the Jews. In fact, if you think about all the, the immigration that's taking place today, this is a, a usual word. You, you hear it in everyday language. Did you know that the, that the term diaspora came from the Jewish migration out of Jerusalem in AD 70? It is this, this hallmark of what happened 2,000 years ago. It is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, a very term that's in everyday use, the diaspora. You have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. But miraculously, miraculously, against all the odds, God's people survived somehow the Holocaust of Hitler. And they returned back not only to the land, but it was agreed by the United Nations that they would call it Israel. On May 14, 1948, the British government turned on its Palestine land, and on May 13, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the independent state of Israel. On that simple approach, they did not call anybody we 
So the state of Israel was born against all the odds. Britain actually withdrew their vote. The only time in international policy where Russia and America have agreed on anything regarding Israel was the establishment of the state of Israel and its name. A miracle. A miracle. But what I want to do before we start our day together, I want us to think about the name Israel because I feel it's not something that's well understood. Shall we have a look then? at this scene in Genesis chapter 32. So we're going to be turning up our scriptures now, and I want us to think about the name Israel. Now, as you go there, I want you to ask yourselves, what do you know by the name Israel? This is a, a name that's synonymous with us, brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Christadelphians, the hope of Israel. Yet how many of us really understand the name of Israel? Now, the reason why I wanted to spell this out, because it is a little confusing. That Jacob has just wrestled with an angel here in Genesis chapter 32. And because of the wrestling, the angel now discloses to Jacob that his name is going to be changed. And it's not altogether clear, is it, when you look carefully at Genesis chapter 32, what his name is. Let's just go then. Verse 28. So the angel then who had wrestled with Jacob for the entire night says, Thy name shall no more be Jacob. Remember, the name Jacob is simply heel catcher. If you've got in your margin supplanter, it is not supplanter. It is heel catcher. Supplanter was the name Esau gave to Jacob. It was not a name that God gave to Jacob. He was simply the heel catcher. No more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Now, what we've got on the, on the screen here, you, you've got two definitions here god prevails or prevail with god they, they mean slightly different things don't they god prevails god prevails through jacob or in association you prevail with god that's the whole idea you can you can overcome your challenges with with god that's the name of israel and that's a lovely thought isn't it those who are associated with the name of israel will overcome all the challenges that come your way if you're associated with god But I don't think that's quite what the name is. So it's a very good reference, the Dictionary of Old Testament Proper Names, probably the best Hebraist we've got or had uh, looking at uh, Old Testament names. And he suggests, and it's not a surprise there, that in that name Israel, there is a future verb. Now think about the name of God. What is the name of God? The name of God is a future verb. I shall be. It is an intention. It is all about God's purpose, revealing himself in this earth, firstly through his son and then through himself. It is an intention. It is a future plan. And this is the same idea with this name. So in other words, then, probably the more accurate name of Israel is there. He will be a prince with God. Although Jacob was a prince with God and he became then the receiver of the promises. What God is saying to Jacob, your name is going to change and it's about a future intention. And it's about people, about men and women and young people who are going to be associated with you, Jacob. Now you think about the promises that the Lord Jesus Christ himself discloses in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. You know that. The promise is to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ and to be kings and priests. It is the fulfillment of that future name of Jacob. Isn't that wonderful? So, so the name then goes beyond. It transcends, as it were, the nation of Israel. It is speaking about the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ granted immortality and living and reigning in God's coming kingdom. Isn't that lovely? There in Genesis chapter 32, you've got God's intention there with the earth. Shall we just have a look then at words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 24. Um, 
For those of you who just want to rest, you can just look at the screen, but I do encourage us all to look up the pages, have a pencil in your hand. We're going to be covering a lot of material today. So, so these are the words of the Lord Jesus. Now learn a parable, verse 32, of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. So in other words then, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, the nation of Israel is likened to a fig tree. And it will be dead and barren because the Lord cursed the fig tree because there was no fruit, remember? And for 2,000 years, that fig tree was dead and dormant. And suddenly, in the pictures that you've just seen in 1948, with David Ben-Gurion announcing to the world the state of Israel, suddenly, leaves are taking place on the tree. Notice that. And we look at the nation of Israel today, surrounded by conflict, of course, but a great economic, political, religious, and military power, isn't it? But what's missing in those verses on the screen? Where's the fruit? There's no fruit. And that's the first thing I want us all to notice. The Lord Jesus Christ says, summer is near when you see leaves. In other words, summer the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of righteousness with healing in his beams. That's the Malachi 4 language, isn't it? Summer. But don't ever expect the nation of Israel, the natural Jews in the land, to be bearing spiritual fruit, meats for repentance. Because the fruits will be the work of Elijah. That's how important Elijah is, brothers and sisters. Elijah is the one who draws out the fruit from the fig tree. So we are to expect no spiritual revival, as it were, no real mass turning to the Lord Jesus Christ until Elijah is sent. That's how important Elijah is. Really important. Now, before we start... In the work of Elijah, I want to put the, the Bible to a test. So let's all get our pencils out. I'm going to show you in the Bible how important these verses are about the revival of the state of Israel. And for those of you who are sitting on the fence, who are still questioning whether the Bible is indeed the inspired word of God, whether there is going to be a kingdom, whether the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return, you think about this. So what we're trying to do now, I'm going to give you three cases, three specific dates that are fulfilled prophetically in Scripture. That goes all the way back to, to scrolls that you can find in the museum in Jerusalem. They are the Dead Sea Scrolls. So let's have a look at this. The first one, then, I want to prove to you is 1897. Right then, let's start in Daniel chapter 12. So get your pencil out. We're going to prove the power of God's word. How can we be convinced in what the scripture says about Elijah, well, let's prove to ourselves the power of God's word. So, 1897, in the revival of the state of Israel, was a massive year. Massive year. Let's have a look. Daniel 12, then. So what you got there? Verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen... Right at the end of the book, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him. Now, this is the all important thing. And, and even though it's out of context, you're going to get this right away. That liveth forever and ever. And it shall be for a times and a half. A time, times and a half. And when he ye shall, he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people all these things shall be finished so so even out of context you can see at the end of verse 7 that there is this time period and the time period notice i've got these words underlined it's worth underlining these words to scatter god's holy people so we're looking at a time period of this phrase here that's all about that is focused on scattering god's people well look at this here so as we've got there daniel 12 verse 7 relates to the scattering of god's people if you've not seen this in the book of Daniel, it's worth noting this. The word time denotes a year. Now, if you 
Where in Israel, you would be living under a 360 day year, not like the 365 and a quarter that we have here. It's 360 days, 12 months, 30 days. Keep your finger in Daniel. Have a look at Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, because... When you're looking at prophecy, often when you're looking at time periods, there is a phrase called a day for a year. You might have heard of that. Let me just show you where that day for a year principle comes. And it's actually not a Christadelphian expression. It is actually a biblical expression. So here now, God is working in the prophet Ezekiel. And he says these words in Ezekiel 4, 4 verse 6. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have anointed thee each a day for a year. So in other words then, the iniquity in the, the, the state of Judah was for 40 years. And so then, poor Ezekiel had to lie on his side as a symbolic... Painful situation that Judah had placed God in for 40 days. Now, now, if we think about it, so it's actually a biblical expression, a day for a year. But you know lots of days for the year. Think about the, the 12 spies. What did they do? They went and they, they scoured the land of Israel. And, and what did they scour? They, they saw the giants, didn't they? And they came back after 40 days. And ten came back with an evil report, and two came back with a good report. And because the evil report, the children of Israel accepted the evil report, they went into the wilderness for 40 years. See that? 40 days for 40 years. That There's another amazing prophecy. Perhaps we'll do it at another day, at a prophecy day, in Daniel chapter 9, which is about the, the 70 weeks prophecy. And essentially, the 70 weeks symbolizes 490 years. From the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem to the, to the cutting off Messiah was 490 years. It's an incredible prophecy. So it runs all the way through the scriptures this day for a year. So when you come back to Daniel chapter 12 and you look at that expression there, a time, times, and the dividing of time, it's, it's, a, it's a very common number in Daniel and Revelation. It is the number 1260. And so then you've got 1260 years. Now, what's really fascinating, if you look at the history of God's people, up to the 7th century, the eastern leg of Rome, called the Byzantium Empire, owned Jerusalem. But after Muhammad, there was this uprise of Islam and the power of the Muslims. And in this period here, in AD 636 and 637, the first dynasty after Muhammad and the second ruler, so right early on in the period of Islam, they go in and they negotiate and they take over Jerusalem. It is then, it is then prized out of Roman hands. It is no longer Christian. It becomes Muslim. And you and on... 1260 years and you come to the year of Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl. Actually, as a family, those of you who've been to the German Bible School just recently, um, next time you go, if the Lord remains away, there's a lovely little hotel in, in Basel or Bar. We went as a family last time we were there. And you've got... The hotel room of Theodore Herzl when he went famously out on his balcony and he overlooked the River Rhine. And during this time, he was establishing support around the world for Zionism. It was the uprise of Zionism. In fact, those of you who have got a few hundred euros to spend, you can, you can spend an evening there. Not that we did. Uh, the River Room of Herzl. And that was the beginning of the revival of God's people. Zionism was all about getting Gentiles out of the land of Israel and again being occupied by the Jews. And so then 1897 was the first Zionist Congress in Bar in Switzerland in 1897. So, so that was the first point where the scattering stops. It was the first time that Zionists around the world expressed a desire to get back into the land. And so important was this year, and you can have my slides after, Herzl wrote later, and, and, and really Herzl was the founder of Zionism. Were I, I to sum up the Baal Congress in 1897, which is the conclusion of this period here in Daniel 12, verse 7, in a world word, which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, it would be 
This at Bar I found the Jewish state. This was the founder of Zionism. And if I said this loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter because 1948 was still years and years away. If not in five years, certainly in 50, everyone will know it. And exactly, add on 50 years to that, 1947, 1948, the Jews were back in the land. Incredible. He didn't even know he was saying a prophecy himself. So that's 1897. Let's look at the next date now, 1917. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 4. It's just worth marking these. I've got these marked out in my Bible. You've got a phrase here all the way through Daniel chapter 4, seven times. Have a look there at the end of verse 16, seven times. See that? The end of verse 23, seven times. Halfway down verse 25, seven times. Verse 32, halfway down verse 32, seven times now the seven times is a prophetic period and and daniel was was telling nebuchadnezzar here that for seven times he would be a beast of the field but this seven times think about nebuchadnezzar nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold he was the first empire that was going to occupy the nation of israel and and suddenly you've got the kingdom of men versus the kingdom of god and he's like the foundation stone he's the first one and so then prophetically this phrase here seven times transcends then the, the period of nebuchadnezzar's life and it's like nations like babylon will be beasts in the land for seven times. Can you see that? They will occupy the land of Israel and bring tyranny to God's people for seven times. Now you think about this here. Seven times, if you think about seven times, you've got 360 days. 360 days times seven because a time is a year. So it's 360 lots of seven. Again, you get to 2,520 days. You've got the references there, a day for a year period. Now here, in this chapter, in Daniel chapter 4, if you took the period when Daniel, under the first wave of Jews, go into Babylon... So Babylon, the Babylonians have come down, taken the Jews into captivity. This is the first moment where there is a Gentile beast in the land. And you add on 2,520 years from 604 BC, you amazingly come to 1917. An amazing year. You might have heard me speak about this. The Balfour Declaration. Where the superpower at the time, Britain, wrote to the Rothschild family, Lord Rothschild, saying that it was Britain's intent to establish a land for God's people in Palestine. The first civil declaration of an intent in the land for 2,000 years. An incredible, incredible year found in Daniel chapter 4. Let's just listen to Lord Rothschild just sharing his news. We will favor the same new Palestine with the national land of the Jewish people. We will lose that best of girls to facilitate the achievement of this object. If we cannot understand that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non Jewish communities in Palestine. All the rights of musical stories in the area of the Israeli culture. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Foundation, who is of the Balfour. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you think that you mean when you say that? I can't believe that it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. I think it took 300 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, so Lord Walter Rothschild, who was the leader of the Zionist movement, was the recipient of this letter from the British government. And Lord Jacob, who was one of the, the richest men in Britain, as you could imagine, he is the great nephew. So he is the, the leader of the Rothschild family within, within Britain. So 1917, an incredible, incredible year. If you were thinking about Jerusalem, what's the year that jumps out? 
What's a year after 1917 and beyond 1948? No, thank you, 1967. Shall we see if we can find 1967? Let's have a look then at Daniel chapter 8. We can find 1967, and we can find 1967 easily. Daniel 8, verse 14, the, the, the chapter, this amazing prophecy of the ram and the he-goat. And, and look at this, Daniel 8, verse 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the, the sanctuary be cleansed. So what have we got a picture here? We've got the goat here, which is the Greek power led by Alexander. And it's attacked by the ram in verse 7, the Medo-Persians. So this is the ram and the ego. Daniel chapter 8 is all about the emergence of the Greek power. It's all about Greek. Because it's going to be this horn from Greece that's going to extend itself into Rome. And destroy God's people. And kill Messiah. So the Greeks are very important. That's why it features so strongly in Daniel chapter 8. Look at this for a time period here. Think about Alexander, the, the great horn of Daniel chapter 8, and the, the battles, really, that established him. Granicus in 334 BC. Isthus in 333 BC. You can just look at these in your history books, and you add on this period here of 2,300 years. I mean, how clear does the scripture have to be that this chapter is all about Alexander the Great? You add on 2,300 years from his first battle... And you get to 1967. A war that Israel should never have got involved in. It was called the Six Day War. Israel didn't even want to get involved. And off the back of that, they took Jerusalem. They didn't have Jerusalem in 1948. So, I think we can take notice of the Bible. Do you? I think we can take notice of the Bible. I have demonstrated that this Bible is all about Israel and it has been codified. Codified for young people like yourself to get ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest event in Israel is about to take place and it is going to surround the future work of Elijah. It is going to be the greatest work that the nation of Israel has ever seen. So this is the picture of 1967. Uh, and look at this. The significance of 1967. It took the West Bank. The West Bank. The place in conflict today. Hamas. You've heard all about Hamas. It's all about the West Bank. And they took it in the Six Day War. And they took Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, then, when Jerusalem finally gets into the, to the hands of the Jews, you get watching. You get watching. And it took place in 1967. So then, let's have a look at Elijah. I think the Bible's got our attention, as it should. Let's then begin in Malachi chapter 4. So just read these words then in Malachi chapter 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. So right away then we're being told that Elijah is going to be involved in instruction. The law of Moses was all about instruction, education, learning God's word. Which I commanded unto him in Horeb. What did Elijah learn in Horeb? Can you remember? The wind and the earthquake and the fire all went past, didn't they, in 1 Kings 19. And what did he find? The still, small voice of persuasion. The power of God's word. Isn't that interesting? It's all about instruction. And now we're reminded of Horeb, the place of the power of God's word. Behold, I will send you Elijah, who was educated at Horeb. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what's his role? What's he going to do? What's his mandate? And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. The heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, now the thing I want you to notice is this. 
Malachi chapter 4 closes your Old Testament scripture. I believe Malachi chapter 4 is nestled between Nehemiah chapters 12 and 13. It's not quite, in fact, the closing words of the Old Testament, but it's the final prophecy. So the final prophetic words that come forth from God is all about Elijah. Have you ever thought about that? The final words of scripture, the Old Testament, Elijah. And then there's 400 years of darkness and silence. And suddenly another character in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke 1 verse 17. And who's that? John the Baptist. And so then the Old Testament closes and the New Testament opens with another figure like Elijah. Have you thought about that? How important is Elijah? We don't give him credit, do we? He's right up here. Right up here. In the history of God's chosen servants now i'm not going to go through all the verses on the screen but just glance at the screen and see how frequently elijah is mentioned and if you look on the screen it's all about conversations so gabriel speaks concerning john the baptist's birth he's going to be like elijah herod when he was listening to john the baptist he was asking amongst themselves is he elijah the Lord Jesus Christ, in his, in his final moments upon the cross, they listened and they said, is he calling for Elijah? You ever thought about that? And the reason why everyone was talking about Elijah is because everyone was expecting Elijah. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ was Messiah, the scripture said Elijah had to come first. Can you see that? So everyone's going, if this man thinks he's Elijah, he's, he's, he's the, the Messiah, the Son of God, then where's Elijah? You see that? But it was John the Baptist who was in the spirit and power of Elijah, and they cut his head off. They disposed of him. Can we have a look at Matthew chapter 17? It's a, a chapter that's really central to understanding what's going on here between the Lord Jesus Christ and Elijah. And it's really easy to understand what's going on. You know something, young, sometimes young people, I think we make the Bible complicated. I think we do. I think we like the Bible to be complicated because it makes us sound a little cleverer. The Bible's simple. Let the word speak to you. Matthew 17, verse 10. So here's the scene. Peter, James and John have been with the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been on a mountain of transfiguration and they've seen. And I believe it was an actual resurrection. Moses and Elijah speaking with the Lord Jesus Christ. You imagine that. So as they're coming down, they're like, oh, we've just seen Elijah. Is this the Elijah that's going to come first to announce the Messiah? Because Malachi 4 says this. This is what's racing to the minds of these disciples. So here's the context. Let's just read carefully what's said. And Jesus' disciples asked the Lord, why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? Now we've answered that question, Malachi 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah, you've got Elias if you're looking at the KJV, it's simply Elijah. Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. So, so notice that. These are words of Jesus. That Elijah would come and he's going to do something incredible. Described as restore all things. That's, that's quite a, a loaded phrase, isn't it? To restore all things. If you restore all things, there's nothing else to restore, is it? It's everything. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already and they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake of John the Baptist. Now it's very, very simple. Matthew chapter 11 tells us that there was John the Baptist and he came in the power of Elijah, turning hearts to the fathers, the children, children to the fathers. And by the time you come to Matthew chapter 14, he was dead. So in Matthew chapter 17, there is no John the Baptist. He's dead. Killed at the hand of Herodias. So Jesus is saying, what, what was John the Baptist's message? He came as the forerunner of Messiah. Had he succeeded? Well, he would only succeed if the nation of Israel had accepted him as the Messiah. But did they? 
They did not. So Jesus says, if John the Baptist had done his job and turned the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, and the children of Israel had all accepted that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he was the Elijah. But because he didn't do it, another Elijah has to come to restore all things. Can you see that? It's, it's really simple. Matthew 14 is the chapter that he died. Let's just go on. I want you to notice that word restore. If you look at Matthew chapter 12, don't, don't have a look at it, but it's always good to, to look at Hebrew and Greek words. And that word restore is only used once more in Matthew's gospel. This is always important when you're looking at books. The way that God has inspired certain writers to use certain phrases. So it's really important. It's more important to look at a Hebrew word or a Greek word in a particular book than to look elsewhere. Always look at the book first to see the consistency in the usage of that word. And here in Matthew chapter 12, it describes how the Lord Jesus Christ healed a crippled hand. Now, how does Jesus heal? Partially? Fully. So much so that it is a revelation of God's power when this man is using his hand that was once crippled. And that is the same word that is used of Elijah. You see that? That's how powerful it's going to be. It's going to be like the nation of Israel was once crippled and becomes then fully, fully used by God. Can you see that? Have a look at Luke chapter 1 because I'm asked often... Did John the Baptist fulfill the work of Elijah? Look at this little detail here. Malachi 4 verse 6 tells us he shall turn the parts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers. OK, so in other words, a universal, a universal turning of God's people. Uh, what was the prophecy of John the Baptist here in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 16? John Remember, the disciples were the disciples of John before they became the disciples of Jesus. So, so, so John was successful in part, but not fully. That's why the children of Israel said, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Look at this word here. I've got it underlined in my Bible. The work of John the Baptist. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Put in your bar margin, please. Malachi 4 verse 6. That categorically proves that John, yes, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he was not Elijah. Elijah is going to bring fruit to the nation of Israel. And God had cursed the fig tree because there was no fruit through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and no better. Let's have a look at John chapter one. And here in John chapter one. Look at this. He's asked. John the Baptist is asked here, verse 21, are you Elijah? <laughs> right? You might be thinking he's Elijah. Well, let's see what John thinks. Aren't you Elijah? He says, I'm not. Are you that prophet? He answered with an exclamation mark, no. Okay, so he's not, Eli he's not Elijah. Let's not get confused with what it says there in Matthew. So let's think about it. Elijah, you might... Uh, if you've, seen, if you've read a book on Elijah, you, you might notice this picture. Elijah, he was a real man. And this real man is going to live again, but he's going to be granted immortality. He's going to pass through the judgment seat and he's going to be sent by the Lord Jesus Christ to bring a revival upon the nation of Israel. When we're looking at prophecy... The prophecies that we're going to look at later today will not say, and this is the work of Elijah. Which is a bit of a pity, isn't it? But what it will say, it will give you a little signature. And it will give you the signature of Elijah's name. So just hold that thought. But at this stage, all I need you to know is the name of Elijah. You think about Elijah. He was up and against the, the 400 50 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah and, and Ahab and Jezebel. And, and what was the contention on Mount Carmel? What was it all about? Who is God? 
He said, Baal or Yahweh. And so then, loaded in his message was his name. My God is Yahweh. Okay? I want you to remember that. The meaning of the name of Elijah, because you're going to see that meaning all the way through Scripture. The prophecies that relate to the, the restoration of God's people. It's amazing once you've spotted it. So, uh, these are my shots. The mountains of Gilead. Have you ever thought about the, the terrain, the topography, the environment that Elijah came from? He was a no-nonsense prophet. He was made of strong and stern stuff. That's his home. Not like Soli Hall, where some of us live. The mountains of Gilead. Oh, you imagine him in Ahab's court. And this is the Jezreel Valley, where Ahab's palace was. And that is Ahab's palace today. Just a heap of stones. Very symbolic, isn't it? Just rubble. I kid you not. I went with uh, Luke. And the first thing I did when I walked into the palace, I accidentally stepped into some cow dung. And whilst then uh, the... Uh, the, the kind of the, the guy was giving us all these details. Luke was just in absolutely hysterics because I was just trying to clean my shoe and I missed out all the details. But that's it. And here I am smiling away with a clean shoe. Uh, but that's what it is. Ahab's palace. Valley of Jezreel. You also find the wall of Jezreel. Remember Jezebel who peered out of the wall of Jezreel? It's still there. And what got me so excited? They found a little vineyard that's connected to the outer wall of the palace. It is Naboth's. And if you see the extent of Ahab's palace, Naboth's vineyard is probably a little larger than the area of the platform. And Ahab owned an area that was as big, as large as you could see. And Ahab wanted that little vineyard. He had everything. But he just wanted that little area of platform. And ends up losing his life over it. Oh, it was a parable in itself, just seeing it. Then you go to Mount Carmel. You see this incredible statue of Elijah there, slaying the prophets of Baal. Trying to get into your mind, this is a real man that's going to walk. Don't think always oh, it's going to be someone. It's going to be a saint. He's going to be like a like. This is Elijah. Without a doubt, it is Elijah. I'm going to show you. I don't know how many of you have been to Mount Carmel. It is absolutely unbelievable. It is beautiful. And that's the valley where the prophets of Baal were slaughtered. Absolutely green. It means, the name Carmel, if you want to know the meaning of the name in Hebrew, it means a park. Does that look like a park? Maybe not the kind of parks we have here, but yes, that's a park, isn't it? Absolutely gorgeous. Now, isn't it interesting? So I've spent a bit of time and I've got to know the, 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 the chief curator at the Israel Museum and the most popular figurine that's just popping out of the earth everywhere, right? A little bales. Everywhere. You can imagine, you know, if we were... Archaeologists in a hundred years' time, if the Lord remains away, and they're kind of scouring, you know, certain parts, they'd probably find Star Wars figurines or something like that in the 70s and the 80s. Well, these are Baal figurines everywhere. Everyone had their own Baal. The storm god. Can you believe that? I wonder how many Baals we've got at home, if we were absolutely honest. And then you've got these, I don't know if you can see that, it's quite a lot of light, but they're really unusual looking things, aren't they? Right? Every had, everyone went. You, you go to the shop and buy one of these. Come back with a smile, with your back full of them. And what's really strange, so, you know, those of you who like your Barbie dolls and you have your little house with Barbie and Ken, that wasn't Mattel. That goes back years. You, you could buy a little house and you, you get your little bail and your little figurines and at night you'd kiss them and you'd, you'd put them in the little house. I kid you not. 
This is Israel. They're popping up all over the land of Israel. This is the idolatry of this place. This is why Elijah was sent. And amazing. When I was last there, the creator said, you're going to love this, Stephen. We've only discovered this a week ago. It's a head of Ahab. So someone, some lucky family, had a little figurine of Ahab. The most amazing thing, and I had to tell the curator about this one. They didn't even realise they had it. It was discovered in the late 60s and it was forgotten. But for me, it was one of the reasons to go to the museum. The name Jezebel is a very unusual name. And they have got the seal of Jezebel. I won't put on this picture for too long. I won't embarrass too many people. But that's it. Jezebel seal, the only discovery of the name of Jezebel. Jezebel seal. Think about that wicked woman who opposed Elijah and Yahweh, the God of Israel. And that is the seal. Discovered these people were real. You go and walk around the palace. They're real, young people. And so then, this real Elijah is going to go forth. And he's going to go to the nation of Israel. Now I, having thought about this for a long time, I've done separate studies on on the work of Elijah, I found 12 reasons, 12 reasons why it will be Elijah that goes forth. And these are all experiences that Elijah had. I'm just going to look at the ones that are in orange here. And think about it. So think about how you're going to go into the kingdom. You know, don't you, through the experiences that you have in life, that God is going to use you and me, God willing, in a good way. He's going to put us to good use. He's going to to use our experiences and our talents. That's why we have this life, to develop our characters. Think about Elijah. What was synonymous with Elijah? Well, the first thing that we notice in 1 Kings 17 verse 1, and it's kind of unique with Elijah. When you when you read of any prophet in scripture, it tells you right away, this is the son of, and his grandfather was this, and this was his tribe. Nothing of Elijah. He appears out of nowhere. He refers to gathering Israel. When he assembles the children of Israel at Mount Carmel, he uses the language To gather the nation of Israel. Think about that. We're going to look at that a little later. He challenged the people's conscience. He asked them, who are you going to worship, Yahweh or Baal? He performed great wonders, didn't he? The fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And then, after three three and a half years of drought, the heavens were opened and there was rain. He spent 40 days in a a very harsh wilderness as he made his way to Horeb, wilderness. I just want you to remember these. We're going to pick up all these things today. These are all experiences that he's going to use in the future. He learns at Horeb the power of the still small voice of calm, which is all about the, the quietness of God's word, working on our minds and our hearts. Think about Elijah was really the founder after Samuel. Of the school of the prophets. And Elisha was one of his students. And then he spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Luke 9 verse 31 that he spoke of his decease. And that word decease in Greek is the word exodus. Moses had an exodus. Jesus was about to have an exodus. And Elijah's exodus will happen. Twelve experiences that make him fit to do this work in God's kingdom. So just think about this. What we're saying here is that I believe the scriptures tell us that Elijah is going to the nation of Israel before Russia comes down. I'm going to say that again because you've got to lodge that in your minds. I believe from scripture 
that an immortal Elijah will go to Israel before Russia comes down. Now, that's a, a really fascinating statement because we see, don't we, Russia today on the move. And scripture tells me that before Russia goes beyond the Ukraine, Elijah has got to go forth. That tells us that we're on borrowed time, doesn't it? A work has to take place in Israel before Russia comes down. And we see Russia so close. So, always as Bible students, when you, when you, when someone, you're having your discussion group, someone says something, always think, you know, those at Hall Green will know that I talk about this all the time. Think about Bible principles. Bible principles are the most important thing that you learn. Bible principles. I can see a number of you in Hall Green nodding your heads because I've kind of drummed that into you. Bible principles. So then, with Elijah going to the nation of Israel before Russia or Gog, the king of the north, however we describe that power, comes down, is there examples in scripture where God sends his prophets, his messengers, to warn Israel of sudden destruction? The answer? Everywhere, without exception. So if you don't have Elijah going there to prepare the nation of Israel before Russia comes down, you are making a precedent. Because the rest of scripture says God always sends his prophets. I've got them here. You can look at my slides. We're not going to go through all of these. I went through all of it. Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them had particular messages. And they're all about warning Israel that if they didn't change their ways... Something was going to happen to them. It goes on. Hosea, Amos, Micah, and now John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. He warns them of AD 70, without exception. All the way through scripture. All the way through scripture. So these words then in Malachi chapter 4, it tells us that Elijah will go before, and there's that phrase, the day of the Lord. So this is a, another detail that is a little difficult to understand. The day of the Lord. What would you understand as the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord seems like it's a day, it's 24 hours. It's not at all. We have to look at scripture to see how that phrase day of the Lord is. And I have. You can have the table afterwards. But there, all the way through scripture, in all the prophets, the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord talks about a whole range of things and it's not confined to a day it describes an epoch of time so Elijah is going to be sent to Israel before the great and dreadful day of the Lord or in other words before an epoch of time that is described as the day of the Lord and when you pull all these together, you see that the day of the Lord is an expression that is used describing God treading down his opposition in all the earth until the establishment of God's kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in righteousness. That entire period where opposition where God faces opposition to the point in time when there is no opposition, that time period is called the day of the Lord. And that's not a day. So don't think the day of the Lord is confined to Armageddon, where there's this great battle in Jerusalem. It goes on and on. Think about it. And we, we think about Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, the, the stone smites the image, doesn't it? Bang! You know the first bang? That's Armageddon. Bang! And then breaks it into pieces and grinds it into powder until a mountain fills. Can you see that? So that whole process of destroying and getting the image to vanish is the day of the Lord. So before the first moment of that day of the Lord period, Elijah goes forth. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, now, 
If you go into Jerusalem today, the most senior synagogue in all the earth is the Herva Synagogue. And um, I'm now talking terms with uh, the chief rabbi there. The Herva Synagogue. And in the Herva Synagogue, which is the oldest synagogue now in Jerusalem because everything has been destroyed over the years, you go into the Herva Synagogue and at the front of the Herva Synagogue, these are my photographs, they were very, very good, allowing me to take these photos. They were quite surprised I knew so much about Elijah. There is this, the seat of Elijah. The Jews in the city of David, the most orthodox of Jews, are expecting those doors to swing open and Elijah to come in with his mantle and then they're going to redress him. You'll see that. In his rabbi royal robes, give him something to eat. And the belief is that he is the one who is going to proclaim Messiah and warn the nation of Israel of Armageddon. Isn't that fascinating? And I believe Elijah will do just that. Not that he'll put on those clothes or even sit in that seat. But that is the obvious place for him to go, to speak to those who are waiting for Elijah. They are waiting for Elijah. And I found them very, very good on their scripture. So with that in mind, this is the sequence, I believe. And it's an important sequence. Look at this. Christ returns for the saints. There is the resurrection. Paul says that in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4. That's the first act of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. We're going to be gathered to judgment. I want us to think during the day. Are you ready to come face to face with Jesus? There's going to be the judgment seat. The saints accepted, rejected. Then there is going to be the marriage of the Lamb. I believe the marriage of the Lamb will take place at judgment. And then, Eli, the, the phrases underlined on the screen are the work of Elijah. That's how important Elijah is. He's, he's up here. He goes out to scattered Israel. Right? Those in the land. He warns them of judgment to come. And then Jesus will stand on Mount of Olives. The great earthquake which we're going to look at. We're going to see a third being saved. And then there's the work of the second Exodus which Elijah will lead. And then there is the defeat of all opposition. At the end of that point, the defeat of all opposition, that penultimate point there on the screen, the day of the Lord finishes. And then the kingdom of God is established. Just a, a very quick advert. Um, the material covered today is in a book. And you can see the book at the front. Um, and if, if you're interested in these kind of things, and I hope you all are, um, I, I'm not on commission. Uh, please have a read of it. I do recommend. But I'll leave you with this, the end of our first talk. Elijah's task is to get Israel ready for Russia. That's the work we're going to look at later. He's going to get Israel ready for Russia. And if we see where Russia is today and what's been in the news the last 24 hours, we could be even closer to that time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because Elijah's got to go forth after Jesus returns. So, as we finish our first talk, I set a little challenge at the end of each talk. And this is my first challenge. And so at the end of this talk, I don't want you just chatting to your friends. Just for 30 seconds or so. Because all this stuff is really exciting and it can just quickly go over your head and you're, you're back into being a normal person again. Not that normal is not good, but you know what I mean. Ask yourselves this question, and I'll ask myself as well, with all this stuff that's going on. Ask yourself, honestly, and challenge yourself. What do you need to do to get yourself ready for Jesus?